Um, I wanted to talk this morning and, and begin our time in Galatians chapter 3, uh, thinking about uh, some foolish marketing decisions that were made uh, in, in the past. And so, uh, as, as we talk about the faith of fools today, I'd like to talk about some, uh, some things, companies that started well with a good product, but then tried to maybe branch out into some areas that, that weren't so great. And so, first of all, we have Bic pens, right? I mean, everybody knows the classic Bic pen. Bic made their entrance into the market and, and did really well. But in, in 1990, Bic thought, you know, maybe we could venture into other markets. And so they uh, test marketed this product. That would be Bic perfume and cologne. So if you want to smell like a ballpoint pen, I don't even know what that smells like. Uh, needless to say, Bic perfume didn't perform very well. Uh, and so the next one we had is Heinz ketchup, right? A classic you know, condiment that has been around forever. Heinz has been doing this forever. And, uh, you know, they were thinking uh, so at some point, maybe we should market this to kids. Like, you know, Heinz is for everyone, but maybe we should market a special one for kids. So in 2006, they branched into the kids market with purple ketchup. Yeah, right. Gross, huh? <laughs> that just looks so... Dis and it's an easy squirt because... Apparently, a normal ketchup bottle is too hard for children. So uh, we got that. Uh, Gerber baby food, a classic staple of children everywhere. Mothers and fathers get this for their, their babies, and it's great. But uh, Gerber baby food in 1974 decided to branch into the adult food market. And so uh, they came up with Gerber singles for adults. And you, you'll notice in the middle, you got liquid beef burgundy. I mean, what, who, who doesn't want to have liquid beef burgundy? <laughs> yeah, gross. Okay, uh, needless to say, it doesn't work. But this last one's my favorite, Colgate toothpaste. I mean, this is a minty, fresh staple of many homes you know, around the whole country, Colgate toothpaste. In 1982, they thought, maybe we should enter a different market. And so they introduced the frozen dinner market with Colgate beef lasagna. Doesn't minty fresh lasagna just sound great to everyone? Uh, you know, maybe not the greatest idea. These companies did something foolish, didn't they? They did something foolish. And so as we think through this text today, what I want you to focus on here as we stare at Galatians chapter 3 is that we're going to see Paul give the very same message to the church. The very same message. He is going to tell the church, he's going to say to the church, what you started with in faith in Jesus, stick with it. Don't venture out into other things. Stick with it. Dance with the one who brought you. Stick with your faith in Jesus Christ. He says, you came to faith in Christ. Why are you now changing the gospel? Don't you recognize the faith you once had? You changed lanes. Come back. Today our title is The Faith of Fools. And Galatians, they started in, in faith, but they continued in their own power. And so originally, I had titled this message instead of The, the Faith of of fools, I had come up with a better title, but it was vetoed down. Uh, my title was, He is Risen, You Fool. I really liked that title, and I wanted to run with it. He is Risen, Your Fool. My wife, however, in her wisdom, told me I couldn't title it that. And, so, and then my assistant, Tara, seconded that vote. And so I got voted down. We're going with the faith of fools, or He is Risen, You Fool. Okay. Um, have you been ignoring the faith that you once had? I wonder. Do you have the faith of a fool? Don't ignore the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Embrace the faith you once knew. So in the book of Galatians, the idea that we've been going with is Paul's writing this letter to a church in the region of Galatia. There's a number of, of churches in different cities, and he's writing to them because someone had snuck in 
and was preaching a different gospel than Paul had preached. They were telling the Galatians, hey, not only do you need faith in Jesus, but to get to the place where you can have faith in Jesus, you first have to become a Jew. You have to be circumcised. One male in every house, the males in the house had to be circumcised to represent the whole household. And if you become Jewish, then you can come to faith. And Paul says, no. That is slavery. He says, come to to faith in Jesus, and that's all you need. And so we've been talking about the gospel of of standing in freedom. Freedom from the weight of trying to be good enough for God. Freedom from the oppressiveness of burdens that others put on us. There's this freedom to the simple gospel message. And so last week we saw the solution to the false gospel is not to compromise the truth but rather the solution is to fully embrace the doctrine of justification. The gospel message is simply that you've been forgiven by the blood of Christ and only through faith can you apply that blood to your life. Have, has your faith become foolish though, I wonder? Has it changed from the faith that you initially expressed when you came to Jesus Christ? Today, if you're here, I want you to ask that, yourself that question. Has your faith become foolish? So we're going to read our text and then we will jump in to our first point, which is already on the screen. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Do you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing through faith? Is your faith foolish? Paul asks five questions in this text, and they're going to become the five questions that I ask of you today. The first question is this. Have you been hypnotized? Have you been hypnotized? He says... Are you, you foolish Galatians? Now, by foolish here, he's not meaning moronic or idiotic. He more is asking, he's always more calling them like the, the, the idea that you're just kind of obtuse. Like you just can't figure it out. One Greek dictionary defines fool as an unwillingness to use one's mental faculties in order to understand. Paul uses the word fool twice in our text today. He said to the Galatians, apparently, apparently, you've heard this false teaching that you've got to become a Jew first, then you become a Christian. Apparently, you've just made up your mind. Like, you're not, you're a fool. You're not going to consider the evidence that's in front of you. You just made up your mind. Uh, it's like a baseball player who comes up to the plate. I actually just saw this happen uh, um, Thursday night when I was watching the Cubs. I know, shocker. And uh, I was watching the Cubs, and Patrick Wisdom comes to the plate. Patrick Wisdom's the Cubs' third baseman. He's been struggling lately. And so he gets to start the season. He gets up to the plate, and he has made up his mind that no matter what the pitch is, he's going to swing at it because he thinks in his head the chances of getting a first pitch strike are pretty good. And he swings, and this ball is in the dirt, like hits the plate basically, and he just looks foolish when he swings at it. That's the idea here. Paul's saying, you foolish Galatians, you've made up your mind to follow a false gospel without even considering the facts. These Galatians had fallen for this false teaching, and they've added works to the gospel, and they didn't want to change their mind. And then he says this question, who has bewitched you? Uh, That word bewitched in our modern vernacular kind of has this idea of someone putting a spell on them. But really this idea is who's caused you to go into a trance? Or maybe we could just say who hypnotized you? Who, Who hypnotized you? The truth is right in front of you and you can't see it. Have you ever seen a hypnotist show? I mean, people are doing crazy things. They're like in a trance and they're doing things they maybe wouldn't normally do. Who has hypnotized you? Who has bewitched you? Paul's holding up this reminder of the good news. It's right in front of their eyes. All they have to do is return to the faith they originally had, but they're just too bamboozled, too hypnotized by this crazy false teaching. 
They're enchanted. They can't see the clear message. And then it says uh, in the text, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This does not mean they all witnessed Jesus' death because there are a lot of Gentiles in this church and they were probably in the region of Turkey where these churches were. Was. They, they wouldn't have been anywhere near Jerusalem to see this. What Paul means is I lived out the crucifixion of Christ in front of you. The crucified life. I lived it as an example. I discipled you. I mentored you. I brought you into the faith. You witnessed this. And now you're ignoring it. If you just think a few verses earlier, Paul says of this crucified life. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's saying, I lived out this life of faith where I was crucified with Christ to the law and I lived by the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. And he said, I did this in front of you and you can't even remember it. You're so bamboozled. He trained them. You are so enamored with this false teaching and this false gospel, Paul says. You love it so much, you couldn't even recall the truth of the gospel message that was lived out. I wonder today if you and I have been seduced by a false teaching. You think, no, Dave, I haven't been seduced by a false teaching. What are you talking about? These Galatians had been seduced by a false teaching. How would you and I be like that? Well, I think in some sense, you and I might embrace a, a bam, be bamboozled when somewhere along the line we prayed and trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins by faith alone, but then added works to it. We say, add things to the gospel. We might say, well, God wants you to be perfect, so you need to get these first things in your life in line first. Then you can come to Jesus. You've been bamboozled. Anybody, anybody who repents of their sins through faith in Christ can be forgiven. God is only love. Some of you would say that. You go, oh, well, I know that, that God, God is love, and that's all I really care about. Well, that's taking something away from the gospel message. The gospel doesn't make sense if God's only love. God is love, and he's the perfect and beautiful expression of love. But if he's only love, there's no justice. Certainly God is love, but there's more. Or maybe to the gospel, you've subtracted something. You said, sin isn't really a deal. It's an old-fashioned word. I'd like to just believe in Jesus without having to worry about sin. Sin is so mean. I can't tell someone they're a sinner. Maybe God doesn't really, maybe sin's not just a, just not a big deal. If there's no sin, Jesus died for nothing. Maybe you've been bamboozled and hypnotized by a message from the world around you and you've changed the gospel. How about this? Paul says, you're hypnotized. You saw the faith, a, a life of, a crucified life of faith in me that modeled Jesus for you. And you're so hypnotized by this new thing, you've forgotten what I did. I wonder, I wonder if we've been hypnotized and forgotten the mentors that God had put in our life who discipled us. Paul had lived the gospel right in front of him but they'd been hypnotized and forgotten what he taught them. Think back to a moment, just for a moment, to whenever you came to Christ, whenever that moment was in your life, someone in your life who demonstrated Jesus to you. Maybe when you were a young believer, there was somebody in your life that modeled it. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher or a youth pastor. Maybe it was your grandparent or your parents. Was there someone in your life who at some point modeled Christian living for you? Have you forgotten about them? Have you forgotten what they showed you? Was there someone who helped you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus who showed you that and you've just forgotten them? Does your life resemble the faith that they taught you? Have you drifted? Have you been hypnotized? Have you been bewitched? To you, I would say, it is never too late to return to the faith that was modeled to you. Snap out of it. 
snap out of your hypnotized state where you've drifted from the good news of the gospel into something else. Remember those in your life. How do you release your foolish faith and return to a genuine faith? Well, the answer is by the Spirit of God. And in the next four questions, Paul is going to highlight for us the power of the Spirit of God in recognizing our foolish faith and returning to the gospel. The second question he asks is, the first one is, have you been hypnotized? The second one is, did you receive the Spirit through faith? Did you receive the Spirit of God through faith? Paul wants them now to think back to when they first placed their faith in Jesus Christ for the free and complete forgiveness of their sins. And so he says, let me ask you this, verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul uses the word Spirit three times in our text today. Sometimes on Easter, we forget about the Holy Spirit. Rightfully so, because Jesus rose and conquered and defeated sin and death. The glory goes to Jesus. Whose power raised Jesus from the dead? The Spirit of God. We see this here in the text. The Holy Spirit, we, and we have to, let me just define that for you. The Holy Spirit is the member of the Trinity. There's the Father, Son, and the Spirit. They are all God. They are each their own individual person without separation. One being three persons. Uh, If you would like me to logically explain all that to you, I can't. But it's the truth that is unveiled in Scripture. I don't know how it works. I just know one God, three persons. And it's the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And then what happens is anyone who comes to a genuine faith in Jesus Christ receives the Spirit. We become temples of the living God and the temple, in our temple, resides the Spirit of God. If you're a believer here today, God's Spirit lives in you. And so what Paul wants to say is, did you receive the Spirit when when you became a believer in Jesus Christ? Did you receive that Spirit by faith or by what you did? There's this internal truth that is often, not always, but often discovered by the believer when she or he comes to faith in Jesus Christ. You just know something is different. There's that something that is different factor. How, what is that? That is the power of the person of the Holy Spirit when he comes to live in you. There's the difference factor. And Paul says, hey, did you come to believe this? Did you receive that experience where you knew? Did that happen when you placed your faith in Jesus or later on when they bamboozled you into thinking that you got to obey the law? Paul knows the answer. He goes, I watched you. You received the power of the Spirit when you believed, not when you added all this other stuff. He knows the answer. All circumcision did was create a lot of pain for them. Like, it's like when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, and you know this, you're going to feel a little pressure right now. You are lying. <laughs> you are lying. That's your nice way of saying this is going to hurt. All it does is hurt. And then it's over. All right. That's circumcision. All it did was create pain for them. Paul knew that some of them had a genuine experience with the Spirit when they came to faith in Christ, and he wants them to remember that moment. Do you remember the moment? That moment when the gospel story was presented to you and when you believed. Now, it's not a moment for everyone. I understand that. Sometimes it's like a period of time. Not everyone has this moment, but there was some time where you went, I know what Dave's talking about. When the Spirit of God came to live in me. I know that somewhere that happened. Some some of you, that process took years. But the question is, did you repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ? You received the Holy Spirit. Not by then being a really good Christian. You received the Holy Spirit through faith. For me, it happened when I was six years old. Uh, I... I was young. I was sitting in my bed. My dad came in to put me to bed, and I was terrified. 
I was terrified because I just had this awareness of my own shortcomings and this fear that I would spend an eternity without Jesus Christ. And I didn't know what that looked like. And my dad came and he kneeled down on, on the floor of my bedroom and he shared with me the message that they had been sharing with me since I was even younger. And, he sh- and I said, I, I, I want to do that. And we prayed together in that moment. In that moment, I believe, the Spirit of God dwelled in me. The Spirit of God dwelled in me through faith. Am I ignore? Are you ignoring that? Do you have an experience? Maybe it's not like that. Maybe it's not when you're six. Maybe it's when you're twenty something or forty something or sixty something. Maybe it was in a period of time somewhere in there. You're like that process took ten years for me. I don't know. But are you ignoring that the Spirit of God lives in you? Did you receive the Spirit through faith or in your efforts later to become a really good person? You received the Spirit through faith. The third question that he's going to ask, if we're going to ask if our faith is foolish, the third one he says is, if you begin with the Spirit in faith, are you now living in your own power? He turns to his third question here, verse 3. I really think these are two questions, but I really think they're just one. Are you so foolish, having been gone by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? You started through faith, when the Spirit of God came to dwell in you and live in you, now you think you can get this all right in your own power? Uh-uh, Paul says. The Galatians thought they could come to Jesus through faith, but then like finish the race in the flesh. Like, I got this on my own. To be like Jesus, some of us believe we just need to work really hard. Okay, thank you for forgiving me, Jesus, but now, and I needed your grace, but now, God, I got this on my own. I'm all good. I'll work really hard to be a good person now. We say I need forgiveness, but we can do the rest on our own. It's ridiculous. We, can, we say to the Holy Spirit, you hop in the back seat now. I got it. You came to Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit residing in you. Do you think that you can finish the journey on your own? You cannot. We treat the Holy Spirit like Google Maps. I like Google Maps. Google Maps ceases the need for me to stop and ask for directions. Some of you don't even remember what that was like, but early in our marriage, we'd have these discussions in the car. Dave, are you lost? No? I know exactly where I'm going. I got this. Dave, should you pull over and ask for directions? Oh, that's the worst question. No! That's humiliating. I got this. Google Maps now? I don't have to ask anybody. I can ask a box who will never know that I asked, right? Like the Google box, I jokingly call it on trips because it makes me sound old. The Google box, it tells me where to go. I like it. I don't have to ask a person for help. Some of us treat the Holy Spirit like this. We say, okay, Holy Spirit, I got you. You forgave me. Thank you very much. Now I got this on my own. Got it in my my own power. I'm good. I don't want to ask to ask for help anymore. On your journey to live, love, and give like Jesus, Why do you think you can be perfected or complete the journey without the Spirit of Jesus? I wonder, do you have anger issues? You say, oh, I needed Jesus to forgive me of that, but I'll beat future anger on my own. Thank you very much. Got a gossip problem? Do you find that tearing others down sort of lifts you up and makes you feel good? Jesus, forgive me of that. But now I'll just do it on my own. I'll work hard not to gossip. I got this. You got a porn addiction? You're committing sin that demoralizes women? You think, Jesus, I need help. Forgive me. But like now, I got this on my own. I can do this. You're prideful? Jesus, I humbled myself when I came to you and asked forgiveness, but now I'll battle my pride on my own. I got this, which is prideful in itself, isn't it? Parenting? Jesus. I confess I have made mistakes, but from here on out, I'll get self-help videos. YouTube will be my guide. There's a good book on this. I got it. No need. The problem with self-help resources, by the way, is that you already have enough self in your life. (laughs) To become like Jesus needs a miracle of the Holy Spirit. You need less self and more spirit. 
When my oldest son, Nicholas, who's now 24, when he was born, I remember holding him and just this wonder of, of this experience of holding my, my child, my baby, in my hands. And I remember at that moment thinking, help me, God. I, I suddenly feel the weight of this responsibility of caring for this little life, of, of raising him in a way where he comes to know Jesus Christ as his Savior, of, of helping him grow. I feel all this, and I am unequipped. I was like uh, 24 years old when Nick was born, and I just was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, fast forward a dozen years, <laughs> and i got four kids now in grade school. And, um, and that's a crazy story, but uh, after an eight-year gap between my youngest, Clarissa and I just felt the Spirit of God leading us to, uh, to have another one. And so as Clarissa is pregnant with our, our then fifth child, one of the thoughts I had, you know, is like, life's good. All my kids can dress themselves. Like, they, they, I don't have car seats anymore. Uh, look at them. They listen to what I say. My oldest is uh, almost going into middle school. And I'm thinking, you know what? I'm a pretty good parent. I'm, I'm pretty good. I got this. Of course, we should have another kid. Because like Clarissa and I, we're the best. Like, look at these kids. So we had two more kids. And then my first four became teenagers. Oh, boy. Then I went, Lord, help me. I don't know what I'm doing. Help. Jesus, help me. Now I have four adult children and two in grade school. Every day I cry out to the Spirit of God, God, we begin this journey trusting in you. And I will move forward on faith because I cannot do this on my own. If you begin by the Spirit, why are you now living in your own power? That's foolish faith. The fourth question he asks then, are you ignoring the experience with the Spirit? Are you ignoring your experience with the Spirit? Verse 4, did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? There's this interesting word suffer here. As I dug into the text, uh, that's one definition of this greek word suffer but it's sort of a little bit our english word is a little bit limited it has it's a big idea it can include suffering but it refers overall to this idea of experience he says are you did you experience so many things in vain that could include suffering option one they've suffered terribly for the gospel and are you just going to leave that suffering? Was it for nothing? And maybe that could be true because the Galatians probably had suffered. But the second option, the word broader use, are you going to leave all the good experiences of the Spirit of God behind? Are you ignoring it? Um, for those of you here today who don't know me and, and, and you're just visiting with us, and I'm so glad you're here. Uh, for those of you who are a regular part of our family, the word deconstruction right now is all the rage. There's, there's Christians or former Christians all over that are deconstructing their faith. And deconstruction isn't bad in and of itself. The idea of deconstruction is simply that you're saying, okay, I've been raised to believe all these things and I'm going to try to deconstruct and remove the ones that are not gospel-centric, that aren't, aren't true, and then put my faith back together in a way that is representative of what God wants for all of us. And, and so I'm removing all the extra stuff. But the problem is, for many of us, we start the process of deconstructing, and you just deconstruct and then never reconstruct. That's a problem. Indeed, Christians sometimes, I will just admit, can be ridiculous. Like, we deserve a hefty eye roll at times. We just do things that just like, ah. And we just deserve a hefty eye roll. It's true. Uh, deconstruction is, is, can be a really good and positive thing. But the rage of deconstruction is to only talk about the horrible bad things that happened to you. You talk about all the 
Trauma, which is a buzzword these days. Tra- you can have trauma for anything. Lollipops can probably cause trauma. And so uh, you can have trauma of anything. And yet you think we focus only on the trauma and we forget about the good experiences that we had with the Spirit of God. I suppose it's in some way human nature to only focus on the bad and not remember the good. Paul says here, do you remember the good things? Do you remember when the Spirit spoke to you and encouraged your heart? Do you remember when another Christian poured his or her life into you? Do you remember when your parents taught you about Jesus in those intimate times that brought meaning to you? Do you remember when somebody loved you unconditionally? When you walked into church and someone gave you a hug and said, you look like you're having a hard day and you experienced the power of God working in the fellowship of believers together. When you experienced forgiveness, do you remember when the weight of guilt was stripped away? So many of us are like so focused on remembering the bad stuff that we forget about the power of the Spirit of God. This is not to diminish the bad things that happen to you. Some of them are genuinely awful. But don't forget about your experience with your saving faith with the Spirit of God. Is your faith foolish? Are you ignoring those experiences? The fifth question we have then in our text is, does the power of the Spirit come through faith or through you? Does the power of the Spirit come through faith or through you. He simply says, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? This is a rhetorical question. (laughs) This is really a rhetorical question. Paul is saying here, I know the answer and you know the answer. The power comes through faith. It didn't come through you and your works. If you came to Jesus through faith, don't abandon that faith and try to do it on your own. The Spirit, He's powerful. The power you can't achieve. All right, it's Easter. How does all of this tie to the resurrection? Because we've been focused on the Spirit of God on a Sunday where we typically focus on Jesus. How does this all tie to the resurrection? There's another passage, I think, that finishes the connection because Paul hints at it here. But Paul, later on when he would write the book of Romans, he answers this question for us. I'm just going to put the text on the screen here. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 11. He says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Do you see this? All of this work on the spirit who lives in you is powered by the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. You have that spirit. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you have the same spirit in you that raised Jesus from the dead. On that Sunday morning nearly 2,000 years ago, the body of our Lord Jesus lay in the tomb, cold and lifeless. That body had been sitting in the tomb since Friday, dead. In the early hours, Of day three, nothing yet had changed. The lungs, his lungs, they didn't move. They were still. His heart was not beating. It was frozen. His blood, all his tissues were breaking down. The normal process of death. In his mind, no neurons were firing. The body was lifeless and cold. But the Spirit of God descended on that decaying body. And in that miraculous moment, everything changed. In that miraculous moment, everything started happening in reverse. 
Because the Spirit of God reversed the curse of death in Jesus. His blood that had been separated out and was becoming in two parts or more, it was decaying, became whole. His tissues and organs that were decaying became regenerating. They started coming back together. His heart began to beat. His lungs filled with air as he gasped and came back to life. A dead man no longer dead. Victory. The Spirit of God defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated death and sin and Satan. And Jesus became alive. Doing all that by the power of the Spirit of God. Who lives in you? Amen! He lives in you. And in our Galatians passage, Paul talks about the importance of this remembering work of the Spirit. Now later in Romans, he reminds us of the power of the Spirit. The Spirit who you receive through faith. The Spirit who is working to make you more like Christ. The Spirit who you experience in the Christian life. All His goodness. The Spirit who does miracles in your life. The Spirit is powerful powerful enough to raise Jesus from the dead. And whatever that thing is in your life that you can't figure out, that you can't conquer in your own power, that problem that's too deep for you, it is not too deep for the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. It is not too big. There is no problem that He can't handle. One of the most ridiculous phrases of the Christian world we say is God won't give you anything he can't, you can't handle. That's just garbage and baloney because you can't handle squat. <laughs> the Spirit of God, there is nothing in your life that He can't handle. I just wonder, you have been given, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you have been given the Spirit of God. And I, I would implore you, remember if you're here today and you're like, I haven't been part of a church family for decades. I haven't been part of a, of a church family that loves Jesus. I, I have forgotten about the work of the Spirit in my life. I remember when I was a kid. If you are here today and that is you, now is the time to remember. Now is the time to give your life to the one who gave his life for you. Now is the time to live for the one who lives and defeated death. Take off your blinders. Snap out of your culturally induced hypnosis. Remember his working in your life. Quit trying to become like Jesus without the power of the Spirit working in your life. Maybe you've been lulled into believing some silly other gospel. Come back. Maybe you've been playing games with God, trying to keep your parents happy while living the life you want to live and ignoring the fact that Jesus gave his life for you. Come back. Stop it. Don't be bamboozled. Return to your faith in Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. If you have trusted in Jesus, that Spirit is alive in you. Christ is risen. Heavenly God, we thank you Father, we thank you, God, for the spirit that lives in those of us who believe. And Father, I pray that that power of the spirit would be working in the hearts and minds of everyone here to remember, to remember this faith. To say, it's not too late to come back. We pray that your spirit would do powerful things, that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, because the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, you are powerful. We worship you today. We pray this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen.